Good evening and welcome to the George Rom Theater. It is seven six eight oh eight and it is Tuesday, March twenty first. We are here to have the finance subcommittee meeting and I will start with a roll call. Miss Sullivan? Here. Mr. Homer? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Ms. Azak? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. And the superintendent is here, and as am I. And so what we have up tonight is a presentation from Aldo Petronio in regards to our first discussion for the fiscal year budget. Sure, you can sit right there. That's fine. Yeah. Thanks, Aldo. Good evening. It's that time of year again. <laughs> Usually we're doing this a little bit earlier because the governor's budget usually comes out uh, the last week of January. But since there's a change uh, in leadership and there's a new governor, they decided to give Governor Healy a little extra time. So um, the governor put her budget out just a few weeks ago. So that basically um, moved this discussion to where we are now. So I'm just, for today, tonight's meeting, I'm just gonna do a, a broad overview of where we were, where we are, how we get our money, and um, how our student count um, factors into our budget. Sounds good. So I, ha I give a handout to everyone. If you turn to the first page, what you'll see here is, this is what's called, um, this is our revenue numbers from the cherry sheet. Every city and town in the state, when the governor's budget comes out, receives a cherry sheet, which has all of their revenue and all of their expenses um, that are netted out against it. What I do is I just pull out our education piece. So we're not seeing the city taxes or the money for the council on aging or for the money for the libraries. We're just looking at strictly education piece. So I listed in here FY20 conference committee, FY21 conference committee, FY22 conference committee, FY23. So those are the past four years. And the reason it's conference committee is because at first the governor puts the budget out, then the house makes their amendments or changes and puts their budget out, then the Senate makes theirs, and at the very end there's a conference committee that they finalize the entire budget with. So I listed the prior four years, you can kind of see the progression and how our Chapter 70 has increased each year, which um, really we had a nice dramatic increase once the Student Opportunity Act came in. Mm -hmm. That brought us in um, uh, more than $10 million in addition to what we usually receive in Chapter 70. So with the governor's budget that just came out, um, chapter 70 went from 224 million to 241 million, which was a $17 million increase, which is a, a great number. And honestly, that number would have been higher had we not lost 356 students. Um, they went off to charter schools and, and, and private schools and other districts. Um, you know, some have moved from Brockton to Fall River, New Bedford, they've, they've moved out of state. Losing 356 students equates to about six, almost $7 million. So that additional money we would have um, received had our enrollment stayed that way. We also receive some reimbursement for charter school tuitions. And the way charter schools work is when our child goes to a charter school, they receive the funding for that student. But the first year, we're held harmless. They give us both that money. So if each student for now is, say, $16,000, they receive it and we receive it. Second, third, and fourth years, we receive a reduced amount until it's phased out that we don't have any more. They, it allows us time to adjust for having those students go to charter. So we received, on top of the $241 million, we received another $7.8 million from charter school reimbursement. And then we have the school choice tuition, which are those students of ours which are going to um, any school that we're doing school choice with, such as Avon High School. Uh, we receive 71000 for them, and vice versa. Those schools receive money for us, for students that go to their school. So those are the revenues, $248 million in revenues, and then we have the assessments. These are automatically taken off the top. So for the students that leave Brockton under school choice, it's a million eight it costs us. Again, it's not just um, Avon, it's West Bridgewater, Bridgewater, anyone that has school choice. So those are the money we pay out. And then the charter school costs. We have to send the money to the charter schools for those students that have gone there. That number is really uh, rising dramatically. It went up um, three and a half million this year from last year. As you can see, back in 2020, our cost was 15.9 million to charter schools. Then the pandemic hit. Um, 
we, um, we had students going to many of the charter schools because they offered in-classroom education. We had more seats opened up at some of the other charter schools. Um, New Heights in Brockton is now fully, um, um, the enrollment is full at 735 students. So each year they've been taken from us. So we went from 15.9 million just a few years ago to 28.6 million this year. It's almost doubled. So basically over $30 million of our money is going out to other schools for students that have left the district. So when you net everything out, we end up about a $14 million increase going forward for this year. I'd hoped for more, but um, that's still not too bad of a number. That number basically now goes to the mayor's office, and then when he works out the budget, um, they'll determine what our um, aid is from the city. Now there's a formula where you'll see on the next page. If we go to page two. Well, Chris, are there any questions on Cherry Sheet and how it works? I do have one. Just a quick question. On the charter school tuition reimbursement, Yes. do we, because the fact that that is based off of students that are leaving, would you be able to forecast on that? Like during this year, would you, will you know as you're looking at students that are leaving the district what that's gonna look like for this time next year? Yes and no. Um, a lot of times they sign up over the summer. So they're here through, through the end of school. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, let's say you know, someone finished the fifth grade and for sixth grade they're going to go to charter school. We assume they're coming back in September. We won't know until September when they don't show up okay. at school. And uh, you know, the first few days, you're not sure who's, who, who is still coming in just late, mm -hmm. but that's when you find out that they're, they've gone to the charter school. So those are the students who want to try and you know, show them that Brockton has a better um, education, better opportunity for them to keep them here. So. No, absolutely. I guess, I guess my concern is if we knew if they were leaving, then we could work on trying to keep them here. But if we don't know and, and we're finding out after they've already left, then it's really hard to pull them from another district to try to get them back. I just didn't know if there was a way for us to anticipate that they're, that they're leaving and try to prevent, stem the flow of the students leaving the district and going somewhere else. Right. So we, we started that this year. The... Um, um, Office of Teaching and Learning put together a showcase um, over at Center Street for all of our eighth graders. Um, so we had um, the Promise High School there. We had people from Brockton High School there, CT Director LVO. Uh, we had, you know, athletic teams. We had Matt Campbell there to talk about. Uh, we had the music department there. So they brought every eighth grader over, and they did this, I believe, over a Three-day three period where they brought every eighth grader from all the schools, and they had a, obviously, you know, they they just did a, a, a rotation. They were there for two hours, um, and it was the first time we've ever done like a showcase of to show what the opportunities here are for Brockton eighth graders going into um, obviously high school. So yeah. we're hoping that that <coughs> yeah. um, will help. Um, we also are getting close to. Um, the end, and we we'll, should get the um, draft or the uh, preview of the video that Jess has been working on. Uh, is it Antoine? Antoine? How do I say? Antoine, Antoine uh, Studios, lo local Brockton uh, production company that we uh, contracted with to do a promotional video, for a 90 uh, second promo promotional video. Yeah about all about the Brockton Public Schools and it is also going to be a 30 second clip of that to I think 40, 30, 40 seconds maybe you said there's there's going to be two versions a full version which is 90 and then a shorter version that you know you can use in, in different places so we're hoping that those kind of things with marketing will will help us perfect I jumped the gun and asked questions does anybody else have any questions Miss Sullivan I was just wondering, um, although I missed the number, you said their total enrollment is at the New Heights? 700, well, they have 735 seats that are approved. Of them, my guess is about 700 are Brockton kids because they pull from um, Randolph and Taunton. That's their, uh, their approved charter. Right. They yep. pull from those towns. So, But most of the kids are from Brockton. All right, thank you. Sure. So the next page, page three, 
I just wanted to show our enrollment and how it's how it increased to a high of 17,600 or so, 17,800, and then how it's dropped um, as it is now, um, at many different factors as to why. I showed in yellow the very bottom of the sheet, 356 less students than last year, 117 before. So in the last three or four years, we've lost almost 1,000 students. So when, again, a good part of that, I'm sure, had to do with the pandemic. Um, real estate values are, are forcing families to go to areas that are less expensive to live. Um, but we're in a situation where we want to get more students. We want to attract more. We're at, at one point, we are at our highest, and we couldn't fit any more in our schools. At that point, we weren't looking favorably to more housing being developed in apartments and buildings. Now we're, I'm, at least myself, I'm looking for more houses and apartment buildings going up so we have more students coming in because our, our schools are here. We have the capacity. So um, that would be great. The number next to that is in purple, the in-district. Those are the students that are actually in our schools, whereas the main number you see there is the number that we're funded for, and that's none of the students in our schools, but also that go out of district to special ed placements and go to charter schools. So there's two numbers that when we talk about our uh, enrollment, uh, the students that are actually here in our schools and then our overall students that we're responsible for. So, I mean, we have 300 and something students that go out in special ed. So is the 295 representative of the 14906 or 16,000? Of the 16,000. Thank you. So, um, like I said, our, our foundation budget goes up every year, but it would go up more if our enrollment um, were to hold more steady. So that's just, I, I keep that for myself because I, I use those numbers when I forecast okay. budget. So. Next page, page oh, four. Ms. Azak has a question. Oh, Sorry, sure. Mr. Petronio, just a quick question. So out of the 1,000 that you've calculated, um, how about our virtual students? Are they part of that 1,000? Even though they're not physically in our schools and they're part of the virtual program? No, yeah, they're, they're, they're counted they, they count in the 1,000? Yes. No, no, not the 1,000 we lost. Okay. No, those are still ours. They're counted in our total um, student. Okay. Yes. So they do. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted clarification sure. on that. Thank you. Sure. Page four is a, a report that uh, both Chris and I get from the Department of Ed. And this basically shows our overall foundation budget for the past couple of years. And it shows how it breaks out between what the city is responsible to pay and what um, we're supposed to have direct receipt of. So if you look at the column, it says uh, on the right-hand side, it says FY24. It shows the enrollment, 16,619 students. With that, the Department of Ed says our budget is 295 million 646 848. Of that, the city is required to to at least spend on our behalf 54 million dollars. And when I say they spend on our behalf, primarily that number is made up for us anyways health insurance, retiree health insurance, and then many of the city functions like part of their payroll office, part of the law office. Those those numbers are all calculated. And it's called Schedule 19. It's something that Chris comprises, and he goes through and pulls actual numbers out of the system on almost all of it to determine how much. Now, the city has always beats that number, and the reason they always beat it is because health insurance is so um, so costly. So uh, it's probably uh, close to $70 million that, that they put in. But they can't drop below that number. And some other communities have a problem with that, that the cities try to, but they can't. So that shows how the aid that's given to us, how it breaks out what we receive. And we're roughly, when you look at it, we're roughly 81% funded by the state. And the graph below just shows the trend in how the Chapter 70 has increased over the past few years. So again, we use this mostly to do our, our stats off of. Now, page five is the real, what I call the meat and potatoes. This is the one that many of us look at Page five also comes from the Department of Ed. This shows us every one of our students, how they're classified and how we're reimbursed for them. So every category has a different dollar amount. So everywhere from preschool, as you'll see, then there's half day, which we have none right now. We have full day kindergarten, elementary, middle. The, at the very top there, it says foundation enrollment. So basically elementary has 6,089 students. 
then the Department of Ed says their ratio says we should be spending, again, $2.6 million on administration, $4.8 million on, when they say uh, instructional leadership, they mean teachers, classroom, uh, uh, classroom teachers, $22 million. The instructional leadership are the, are the specialists in addition to the teachers, the reading specialists, the math specialists. And it goes through and it breaks it all down and basically says, you know, you have about $57 million towards your elementary then they go to the middle school, about 36 million. Those numbers, we don't have a lot of control over, not a lot of um, um, ways of, of trying to get more or change them. It's the next set of numbers, categories or columns eight through 13. So special ed in district, any students that's considered special ed is coded in the system as special ed and receives special ed services. We get additional money for those students. So we get additional 19 million. Students that are special ed that are tuitioned out, meaning they go to the private schools. So we have 160 of them, and again, we get a certain amount of money towards them. Now, some of those students cost us a lot more than you see here that we get reimbursed for, but this is where the um, circuit breaker funds come in. When we're spending over this year's amount is around 38,000. When we're spending over that amount, we get reimbursed about 75% of what we spent. So it still costs us in the end about 50000 for each student, and we're reimbursed about, uh, about 17000 a student. But it's something that they give us right away in our budget, and then we receive the additional funds later in Circuit Breaker, which we use to supplement and pay for out-of-district tuitions. Does it eventually balance out? No. We always lose. Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> so um, the next few categories are the English language learners, our ELAs. So you see pre-K to five, six to eight, and high school. And again, from our student database, they're all coded. The Department of Ed sees that, and in turn, they determine these are, again, how much, how many, how much in additional funds we'll receive for each of those categories. So the, again, the, 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 urban, um, the urban districts have this. Many of the suburban districts, very minimal. So you'll hear that. The urbans get all the funding. Well, that's the reason why we get a lot of the funding is because we have primarily these students here. Category 13, I highlighted in yellow because for us, that's a huge category. This is the whole premises behind the Student Opportunity Act, Brockton suing the state, the Webby case, all of that. These are our low-income students, and we receive additional funding for all of our low-income students. And we go through a big process where our student database is sent to the Department of Ed, and they compare that to all of the state um, um, entitlement programs they have. And when they match up students and families, they get coded as low income, and we receive additional funding for all of them. So as you can see, we received 91 million additional funding for those low income students. Now, we've always counted on that category, and honestly, we deserve and we need that category because these are students that are most at risk that need the additional support and, and programs that we offer. But I drew some red arrows in there to show you something. The way the categories work for funding on this, 10%, 20%, 30%, and it's the range. So if you're at 80%, you'll be in low-income group 12, which is the highest reimbursement rate. This year, FY23, and now next year, FY24, we're at 75.59%. We're yeah, losing out. 79. 79.59. So we are 0.41% away from being in the highest category. That's costing us over $6 million. So we're hoping, I'm making, I've made calls. Oh, my God. 61 kids short. 69. Oh 69. 69 kids short. 69 uh, kids short. And a lot of that effort has been school effort to get students um, and student families help. Um, we have Janice Johnson Plumer, who's our advocate, who goes out, helps these families, helps them get SNAP, helps them get benefits, helps them get mass health. For everyone she does, it counts on our low income count. And the fact that we lost so many students and still have this number is a lot of it has to do with her effort. Because last, this current year, we are at 70, I think, 7% um, low income? 75. 75? We're at 75%. So we're far away from the 80%. <clears throat> we are so close. So we're hoping that there's something we can do, some consideration we can get for this that would bring in a lot more money. 
um, but it's, it's very important for us to help those families uh, um, to get them any sort of state assistance to get them classified and picked up. And it just to, as a note, it's very, um, Janice does an amazing job, but it's um, you have families that are very nervous about filling out applications for the state to get connected to SNAP benefits because it, you know some of them are illegal, and they're very concerned about filling out official paperwork, even though. We tell them that, you know, it's not something that, you know, ICE is not going to come if you fill. But, however, when you're in that position, you don't want to fill paperwork out. So, you know, that's, you know, we have well over the 69 kids we're short that fall into that category. You're just not getting the SNAP benefits or any state benefits that allows us to count them. Yes. And then the application process that has to be filled out for a parent um, to be considered low income is you know what is it called Allo? the process it's it's a credit authorization form it's four pages long compared to a lunch application it used to be two pages long yeah so, so it's a family harder. would have to fill out a four page long application process for us to if they're not connected to snap automatically for us to get them in and the application so. asks for proof of income which right so we urban superintendent net urban superintendents network has in the uh, has fought with uh, the Department of Ed over this for several years now because of the students that are undocumented that yeah. are not being counted that we're not really getting funded for so this is something that has been a fight for the urban superintendent network for well over eight years now yes again it was a, it was really the premise for the student opportunity act for the lawsuit it was the fact that they weren't counting all of our students remember Brockton kids count they weren't counting our students. So that's what we pushed and pushed on. We got them to expand their databases so they now match up against Medicaid. They now match up against, there's a category in Mass Health where if an, you know, an undocumented child goes to the hospital, they have his record in there, and they have that record stays for 12 months and drops off. We were able to get them to match to that so that we at least pick that up. So they've, they've made the reference, but what we've asked ourselves and MASS um, is why can't our adjustment counselors certify if a child is poor? They're licensed by you, Department of Ed, and the answer is no. So allow it. just out of curiosity, if we found these 61 kids over the next few weeks, that's not going to change this for this year. We have to do it over to the next year to be able to get to the 80% by next year, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. What I'm asking, uh, I sent to a couple of our state reps, is I'm asking, can there be a pothole fund set up for those that are this close mm -hmm. that we receive something? So they've done it in the past where if you've dropped enrollment by more than 300 students, if you've added more than 300 students, you would receive additional funding. These are pothole funds that they create. I'm asking, can you create someone that's on the fringe of something like this? And our hopes is that we can receive something for it. Because since September to now, our homeless population has gone from just under 500 to almost 1,000. Now, some of those students might already be counted as low income, but some of them are new that are coming here from, from other states and from other places. So that increase is something that really affects us when you know, we have to, you know, if you think about it, if they're, if they're all new students arriving, we need to set up more classrooms. So there's additional costs. So that's what we're hoping for. Like I said, this page is, is something that many of us look at. It's important to see the breakout of our enrollment. Um, I, it tells us how we should budget. It tells us how we should staff. Um, you know, again, the bilingual department, the special ed department, it, it, it plays into how many students we have in each. So. As you can see, the English language learners, we have 2,400, uh, 3,200. We've got five, almost 5,500 English language learners. That's a third of our population, mm -hmm. you know, of our student population. So it tells us where we need to kind of focus. The last page on this is just a budget timeline, just um, for everyone just to know how it goes through the House and Senate. And um, we've been through that before. 
um, you know, the governor puts out the budget, and then from there the House puts out a budget, and then a month, you know, in April, then a month later the Senate puts out a budget, then there's a conference committee, and we, by about June, know what the final budget is. So meanwhile, we start building the budget that we have for the school department off of the governor's number, because that's the one number we're given to forecast and work from. So what we're doing now is we're working through that. We're looking at our student enrollment, and we're seeing um, what needs to change, what can consolidate. Um, the city will give me some figures on health insurance, because uh, health insurance, even if it changes by 2%, that's millions of dollars for us. So we can't settle on a number just yet. Probably another couple of weeks, I'll have some firm numbers from the city. At that point, working with the with the governor's numbers, we'll know where to start our budget from and what we look at. And we'll, Chris and I will take the current budget. We'll factor in all the contracts that you've settled for next year. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go through the program with the superintendent of what programs. And then we'll come up with an estimated budget. We'll determine whether we're okay, whether we have a shortfall in the budget, um, where we can consolidate if we need to consolidate. Then we'll bring that forward to the committee here so you can see where we are. What's the biggest, aside from the governor's numbers, what is the biggest variable that we can't count on in this right now that could change? Uh, I think, well, um, it would basically only, usually from historically, it only goes up. Okay. Because the House and Senate will add money. Right. Uh, and then, um, was it two weeks ago, we were at the legislative breakfast that was put on by the South Shore Superintendent Network. So each superintendent network in each section of the um, state is put on at breakfast and it was mostly for uh, we went because we're part of that network but that was mostly for the suburbs because um, the suburbs it was about a, about 162 towns around the state are only seeing a $30 increase in their SAP chapter 70 aid and three zero three zero thirty dollars per student, student. Oh my for God. a student so Obviously, they're not very happy because yeah. <laughs> the Student Opportunity Act hasn't worked for them because you're talking about, you know, towns who are, are not poor yeah. and they're not rich like Wellesley. So they're stuck in the middle. So they, you know, they, you know, so they're now really loud about, mm. you know, you don't hear from us because, you know, we, I don't feel bad for them, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. their, their um, advocacy can only help us. Because yeah. I know that they're pushing to it to go to $100 a student uh, instead of the only the 30. And uh, as you know, there's a lot of state reps and state senators that represent those areas. That's a lot of towns, 161 across the state. So I think their voice will be heard. So I think hopefully, as we've seen in the last few years, that the House and Senate end up adding money. And I know that the governor is looking to put in a supplemental budget to help with out-of-district placement costs. Um, around transportation and actually the, the cost of the tuition that's gone up 14 percent? Yeah, so the, we, every year the OSD puts out a percentage rate for the entire budget. It's usually around 2 percent. This year they carved out the out-of-district schools, the special education schools, and gave them a 14 percent increase, which for us, our costs will go up at least a million and a half dollars in that one line item, which is huge. Every community is screaming about it. So now the governor is looking, I think, to try and make up that money to all of us, which would be great um, if, they, if it comes through. But that's, that's a good question. That's one of our big variables is that, mm -hmm. that million and a half extra. And, then, and the reason why all the districts are, are very loud about it is because, as you know, from COVID, social-emotional issues, and there are a lot of, not only Brockton, I mean, most districts are, um, have to send students out of district to get them the help. Yeah. and services that they need that you cannot provide in the district. So those numbers have gone up so far, and then with the state increasing the tuition, uh, allowing them to re increase the tuition obviously cost us more money. So right. that's another thing that they're looking to do. A su Actually, the governor, I think, is going to try to do that before the House and Senate even start to develop their budget. Correct. And, and along with that, for two years here, we had... Um, each employee received uh, one month's premium of health insurance returned because the health insurance trust fund was very healthy. People weren't going to the doctors, but they weren't going to the doctors because of COVID. They all stayed home. So now this year, I was told to expect a pretty big increase because in the past 12 months, everybody's been going to the doctors. Everyone's been going. So 
Um, that's the second variable that's large in this budget is health insurance. The third we're working to get a handle on, Chris and I, is electricity and gas. So we're in long-term contracts with that, but we need to go through and see exactly what the escalator is in those because, our, for example, our electricity budget's around $3 million, and people were seeing 30% increases. We weren't, but they were seeing 30. Well, that would be a million-dollar increase to our electricity line out of that case, and same thing with gas. So we're watching that closely to see what number we should forecast in there for gas and and, and gas and electricity. Um, in the non-net budget, which I haven't brought anything forward on, um, our costs that we have have uh, planned on are all the, they're all the same, they're all within the budget. What we didn't plan on is all the additional door-to-door -door pickups due to special education, you know, um, um, IEPs if it's required. Those require, again, a lot of them are van to go pick them up that we have to pay a private party for. And our number of homeless students um, has increased um, more than double than what it was. So that is also affecting the budget. These are two areas we have no control over. So um, the non-net budget will have that factor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna carve it out separately because I know that, you know, I know the mayor, I know the, Troy uh, are not gonna be happy with that number because everyone wants to see, now that we own transportation, they wanna see the costs go down. Well, for the basic transportation of our regular ed kids, it's going to go down. Basically, our first student piece that we had before is going is either staying the same or going down. But the piece that's variable is the special ed and the homeless, the McKenna Vento homeless. That piece is going through the roof. And in our research, working on this the past week or so, because you know Chris and I we couldn't figure out why the cost went up so dramatically. And talking to Karen McCarthy, our Title One, our homeless liaison. She said that the moratorium on evictions was lifted back in September. So all these families that were in apartments that couldn't pay the rent are now being evicted. So now they're all falling into that homeless category, which in turn you know, puts an unfunded mandate on us to take care of them. So um, yeah, the homeless number has tripled since September. Yeah, I bet. Oh, God, that's terrible. So, um, like but we're I said, still we, short 69 kids. I know. I was <laughs> just thinking the same thing. I'm like, and we're still short. It's, you know, when you, th when you think about how close we are, um, that number is just so small. I was really, I was going to ask, I did ask some of the people at the Department of Ed, can you round? Can you round <laughs> the number for me? Up? You know, so, um, but I think they see the same thing. Well, if we round it, it rounds for everybody. What does it do across the whole picture? So yeah, you might get six million, but we might have to re reduce your appropriation by a little bit. That's fine. Give me five million. If you got to spread the money out, I'll take it. So, um, and that's so that's where we stand now. Um, we're going through Chris and I, department by department and contract by contract, to determine the costs for the salary increases um, of every unit that we have and projecting out for next year. So in the next couple of meetings, we'll start bringing that forward. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Aldo? Mr. Homer? Just on that, uh, on page five, the projection for the preschool number, the 489, is that projected to be the same as what we had this year, or is that a projected increase, and does that have a different source of funding from the state for preschool money that's, that's allotted less. for kids versus, that's less than what we have now? Yeah, it's, the, the reimbursement's not the same. It's, it's less um, than 5,000 a piece. It's less than five, it's about 4,700 a student. Um, it will go up because, um, of early intervention. So obviously, you know, uh, the pre-K students who are early identified for special needs services will, ha we have to give them seats. So um, we see that number going up because of COVID, um, you know, students being home so long. So you're seeing a lot of three, four year olds that are getting early intervention. And, and, it, and this is another thing we're trying to, you know, the state wants to continue to talk about universal pre-K, but you have to fund universal pre-K because a pre-K classroom cost you a lot more than a regular education classroom because it needs a, obviously a teacher and then two paras because you know there's diaper changing there's there's a lot that goes into right. um, a pre-k class and and it also comes with transportation so that's a good question mr homer any other questions okay Thank you, Mr. Petronio. That was Thank great. You.
that's all we have for the finance subcommittee. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Ms. Sullivan first. Ms. Azak.